In this lecture, we will talk about ventilation. We will describe the terms ventilation and respiration. We're going to talk about the process of ventilation, including the pressure volume changes, the movement of the chest wall, and the coupling of the lungs to the chest wall. We're going to explain the significance of the pressure within the pleural space and describe what can happen during a pneumothorax. We will also talk about compliance and airway resistance and how they affect ventilation and the work of breathing. So the respiratory system supplies the body with oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. As we talked about in our introductory lecture, ventilation is an important part of this process because it brings air into the body. In addition to ventilation, we will also, in the next lecture, talk about respiration and gas transport. So ventilation is movement of the air in and out of the lungs. This is through breathing, and it's conduction of the air through the airways all the way down to the alveoli. Respiration, on the other hand, is gas exchange. So when we say respiration, we're talking about gas exchange. When we say ventilation, we're talking about conduction or movement of air. Ventilation includes inspiration, which is moving air into the lungs, and expiration, which is moving air out of the lungs. This requires coordination of the muscles of the chest wall and the diaphragm, and also airflow through pressure gradients and against resistance. Inspiration requires a change in the thoracic volume or the volume of the chest cavity. If you take a deep breath now, put your hand on your chest and feel how your chest cavity changes. So deep breath in, and then deep breath out. What you'll notice if you hold your hand on your chest while you're breathing is that the volume of your chest cavity expands or opens up during inspiration. That allows the pressure in the chest cavity to go down so that air can move in. During expiration, the muscles relax and the chest cavity returns back down to its normal size. And if we want to do a forced expiration, we can compress the chest cavity even more by contracting another set of muscles that squeezes and reduces the volume of the chest cavity. Squeezing on the chest cavity and reducing the volume of the chest cavity increases pressure and causes air to move out. So this is a summary of the muscles that are involved in breathing. For inspiration, we have contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostals. For a forced inspiration, we can add in these neck muscles, the sternocleidomastoid and the scalenes. Expiration is passive. It doesn't require any contraction, just a relaxation of the diaphragm. But a forced expiration can activate the internal intercostals and also the abdominal muscles and that can force more out during a strained or forced expiration. So inspiration is air in and increasing the volume of the chest cavity. Expiration is air out by decreasing the volume of the chest cavity. This follows something called Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law is a principle that says that a pressure exerted by a gas in a closed container is proportional to the volume of gas in the container. Inversely proportional means that as the volume goes down, the pressure goes up. Or as the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. And this is creating these high to low pressure gradients that we need to move air in. So as we increase the volume of the thoracic cavity, that decreases the pressure and air will move from high to low, from the outside to the inside. As we squeeze on the chest cavity, we decrease the volume of the chest cavity. That increases the pressure, and now air will move from high inside to low outside. These pressure changes are essential for allowing inspiration and expiration to take.
In order for the lungs to stay inflated and coupled to the chest wall, we have pressure within the pleural space. Remember we talked about the surface tension of the pleura sticking the lungs to the chest wall. So we actually need a negative pressure or a negative transmural gradient between the lungs and the chest wall. And that takes place within the pleural cavity. So the pressure in the pleural cavity is always less than the pressure in the thoracic cavity. And it's usually about negative four millimeters of mercury, although it can vary in different portions of the lungs. This causes a negative pressure sticking the pleura to the thoracic cavity. This keeps the lungs inflated within the chest wall. Any disruption of the transmural pressure gradient, for example, some kind of disruption of the visceral pleura through a break between the lungs and the visceral pleura, a disruption in the parietal pleura, for example, because of a trauma or a break in the chest wall through the parietal pleura, and fluid entering into the pleural cavity, any disruption of this transmural pressure gradient can make it so that the lungs are no longer coupled to the chest wall. And then as the chest expands and decreases in volume, the lungs are no longer moving along with the chest wall. So you can move the chest wall until the cows come home, but if there's no transmural pressure gradient, the lungs are going to collapse and not follow the chest wall. So a loss of pressure in the pleural cavity can lead to lung collapse. Collapse of the lungs because of a disruption of the pleural membrane or a disruption of the chest wall is called a pneumothorax. There are many different types of pneumothorax that are pictured here and you will learn about these in your medicine courses. As I said in the previous slide, this can be because of a disruption in the chest wall, a disruption in the lungs themselves, and each one can lead to, in the very extreme cases, a collapsed lung as you lose that pressure gradient and the lung is no longer coupled to the chest wall. So, the lungs are expanding and recoiling along with the chest wall. Chest wall movement is incredibly important for allowing the air pressure gradients to be created for air to move in and out of the lungs. The lungs will then pull outward with the chest wall because of this pleural pressure gradient and also because of their elastic recoil or their natural tendency to collapse inward. So expansion of the chest wall is air in, recoil of the lungs and the chest wall leads to air out. While we're talking about ventilation, it's very important to talk about the topic of compliance. Compliance is a measure of how easily a structure can be stretched. The more elastic a structure is, the less compliance it has. So think of blowing up a really, really tight versus a very loose balloon. So something that has really high compliance is compliant with the air blowing it up. It says, okay, I will respond. High compliance is loose or easy inflation of a structure. Low compliance, on the other hand, is stiffer, extremely elastic, even fibrotic or stiffened or scar tissue that is hard to inflate. So as you add pressure to it, it doesn't respond well to that pressure and it doesn't inflate well. Examples of a highly compliant lung where you have too much compliance would be emphysema, where you have destruction of airspace and decreased elasticity. Examples of a low compliance would be a pulmonary fibrosis, where you have buildup of scar tissue and stiffening of the lungs, and then it's very, very hard to inflate them. So in emphysema, we see overinflated lungs. In fibrosis, we see underinflated lungs. This principle of compliance is very important as you learn about obstructive and restrictive and related respiratory conditions.
There are many factors that affect the compliance of the lungs. Collagen or buildup of collagen in scar tissue or elastin or too much elasticity can decrease compliance. That means that the airways have to work harder against that scar tissue or elasticity in order to inflate. Fluid can also decrease compliance. Fluid on the surface of the alveoli creates a surface tension that leads to enhanced recoil and opposes the expansion of the alveoli. An excess fluid can be present during certain respiratory infections, and that makes it difficult to expand the lungs and breathe. Pulmonary surfactant, on the other hand, helps compliance. It's a fluid secreted by the type 2 alveolar cells that counteracts and balances the fluid surface tension to reduce surface tension and increase compliance. That is, it helps to keep the lungs inflated in response to pressure. So it helps the alveoli expand against fluid. Unfortunately, it develops late in fetal development. And this can lead to respiratory problems in premature babies who are born before their type 2 alveolar cells have matured. There are certain ways to help with this problem. Mothers who are at risk for preterm labor can be given certain medications that will mature the type 2 alveolar cells. Also, babies who are born prematurely can be given surfactant within the lungs in order to take the place of the surfactant that their lungs are not yet producing. Some of the earliest studies on surfactant in premature babies were actually done at UC Davis, and I can show you some of that research if you're interested. We also want to think about resistance of the airways. Similar to blood flow, airflow through the airways depends on the tube, the length, the radius, and the cross-sectional area of the airways. It also depends on the density, the viscosity, and the velocity of the gas moving through the airways. So as the airways narrow, just like as blood vessels narrow, we can increase the resistance of the airways. And that makes it more difficult for air to pass through. The radius of the bronchioles is the most important contributor to airway resistance. This is controlled by smooth muscle with both parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system input. Constriction of the bronchioles decreases the radius of the bronchioles and increases resistance. This reduces airflow. There's a little bit of parasympathetic input tonically at rest, which keeps the airways just a little bit constricted. Of course, there is pathological constriction of the airways as well. Allergies with histamine release, inflammatory factors, excess mucus in chronic lung disease. This can all lead to narrowing of the airways and difficulty with air flow through the respiratory passages. A bronchodilation increases the radius of the bronchioles and decreases their resistance, allowing air flow to increase. This is done by sympathetic nervous system input, epinephrine, during increased activity, but can also be done to help to counteract constriction of the bronchioles. This is why we have bronchodilators, which are essentially part of the sympathetic nervous system pathway. Albuterol, for example, is synthetic epinephrine, which is a dilator which can open up the bronchioles and allow for more airflow. It's also the reason why we give children with allergies EpiPens, epinephrine. If there's an anaphylactic reaction or we're worried about closure of the airways, can help to dilate the bronchioles and open up those airways, allowing more airflow in. So both compliance and resistance can change the work of breathing. The work of breathing is that perception of how hard it is to breathe. It's a combination of both compliance and resistance. More effort is required in certain disease states. If there's a problem with compliance in the lungs or a problem with compliance of the chest wall, 
then we'll have difficulty with expansion of the lungs and the chest wall. If there's high resistance in the airways, for example, a spasm, a constriction of the bronchioles, or excess mucus buildup, and that can also create an increased muscular effort to help to move air through the airways. This can lead to higher oxygen and ATP demands when the work of breathing is higher. Finally, as we're talking about the actions of these muscles, let's talk about the control of breathing. So the diaphragm is a skeletal muscle with motor innervation by the phrenic nerve. So we talked about the phrenic nerve with the pain innervation and the three Ps. This is actually the most important function of the phrenic nerve, control of the diaphragm. So breathing is generally involuntary through control of the diaphragm. The rhythm and rate is set by the respiratory centers in the brainstem. So don't get mixed up by the fact that the diaphragm is skeletal muscle. The rhythm and rate of breathing and the control of the diaphragm through the phrenic nerve is set by groups of respiratory neurons in the medulla. We have the dorsal and ventral respiratory groups in the medulla, which set the basic rhythm of breathing. And then we have the pneumotoxic and the apneustic centers in the pons, which can modify the depth and rate of breathing. So phrenic nerve to the diaphragm controls the basic rhythm of breathing through the centers in the medulla. We can also have autonomic reflexes through the sympathetic and parasympathetic input to the lungs that can do the bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. But remember, that's just opening and closing the airways. That's not setting the rate and rhythm or the depth of breathing. So this is the rate and rhythm and depth of breathing through the medulla and the pons. All right, that's it for ventilation. Let me know if you have any questions.